All right. Hello, students and viewers. Um, I've had some trouble with commas in one of my recent classes, and I wanted to kind of talk through some of the common reasons that we use commas and show some examples of how to use commas and how not to use commas. And so um, dusted off the old PowerPoint presentations here and um, try to do a recording. So bear with me. This is first time I've done it in a while, so a lot of new functionality and cool stuff, but we'll dive right into it. So commas have been officially clarifying sentences since the 15th century. Um, that's when a printer in Italy called Aldus Minutius uh, introduced some new punctuations such as commas. And so uh, a little fun little historical perspective there. The reason I think a lot of people struggle with commas is because the comma is used for a lot of reasons in English writing. And um, so for that reason and many more, uh, the best bet usually is to find a reference, a good reference material. Uh, in my class currently, we're using Hacker and Summer's Pocket Style Manual. Um, it's the APA 7th edition, and they have a, about seven or eight pages there all about commas. And uh, there's, of course, no shortage of good advice about commas online and in a lot of other places. So uh, pick up a good reference manual, peruse through it, get familiar with the comma, see what examples they have, and, uh, and keep listening. And we'll talk about some, some of the more common, more common reasons that we use commas. All right, one of the first reasons we use the comma is before a coordinating conjunction joining independent clauses. And if you're not familiar with grammar and some of, and what the conjunctions are, parts of speech, um, then you might be a little lost here. So let's talk a little bit about those two things. Uh, the first question is, what's an independent clause? An independent clause is a complete sentence. What's a complete sentence? A complete sentence is any clause that has both a subject and a verb, um, and usually that's that's a noun and a verb. And so we have a very simple straightforward independent clause right here. It's spot runs. And we have the subject of the sentence doing the action, that's spot. And we have the verb, which is the action the subject is doing, and that's runs. So we have two uh, essential elements there for an independent clause. We have a subject and a verb. And so just those two words can be an independent clause all by themselves. And every sentence, if you really break it down, can be a spot run sentence because you're going to have a subject, a verb, and a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> uh, so sometimes that subject is complex. Sometimes the verb is complex or has two parts or three parts. Sometimes there's a lot of uh, prepositional phrases and other stuff in there. But every sentence can be broken down into a spot run sentence if you can, if you can diagram it, find the subject and the verb. What are the coordinating conjunctions? Coordinating conjunctions, uh, a lot of you guys maybe probably remember, fanboys. And fanboys is, stands for the coordinating conjunctions, the most common of them. That's for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. Um, so if you remember fanboys, those are the words that are associated with that. They're the coordinating conjunctions, and they usually connect independent clauses. And we'll look at some examples of that on the next slide. All right, so we have our independent clauses here. We know what those are, so we look at some simple examples. We have spot runs, spot hides. Those are our two independent clauses, and we are connecting them using a coordinating conjunction, one of those fanboys. So we've got our subject, spot, and our verb, runs. We've got our subject, spot, and our verb, hides. And then we're connecting them using the comma and the coordinating conjunction, which also happens to be and. Um, and so this is correct because we have the comma and the coordinating conjunction joining two independent clauses. So we're good, good news there. Next one here, we have spot runs, spot hides. Uh, this is another way that we can separate independent clauses. And so um, we have our subject, spot, and we have our verb, runs. We have another subject, spot. And what's he doing? He's hiding. So there's our verb. And so we're going to separate those with a period because they're complete sentences. And we can do that. That's totally fine. Um, so we can either use a period to separate them or we can connect them with 
an independent or uh, with a coordinate conjunction and a comma. All right, so this works too. Here we've got another scenario. Okay, we've got our independent clauses. We've got our subject spot. We've got our verb runs. We've got our subject spot. What's he doing? He hides. So we got our two independent clauses, but here the comma is all alone. It's all by itself there. Um, and the comma all by itself is not strong enough to connect independent clauses. And so we need one of those fanboys in there um, to help that comma out. And so this is actually incorrect. And it's known as a comma splice because the comma is splicing two independent clauses without its coordinating conjunction to, to help. And so that's a common mistake that people make. They have two sentences and they try and connect them using a comma um, or split them up using a comma. And that, that doesn't work all on its own. You have to have a comma and one of those coordinating conjunctions. Get some other examples here. All right, so we have two independent clauses. These are a little more complicated than spot run sentences. We have the Leaning Tower of Pisa is a national landmark. And we have another independent clause. Its estimated weight is 14,500 metric tons. Now, the problem with this sentence, as it is, is that it's a run on. This is where we have two or more independent clauses with nothing to separate them or connect them. So here I've highlighted them for you. We have our two independent clauses. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is a national landmark. And we have its estimated weight is 14,500 metric tons. Um, all by themselves, without any connections or separations, these two independent clauses can't just keep running on. And so this is another very common mistake. It's a run-on sentence. So we have to do something to change it and edit it. Here are some options. We talked about one of them already. We use a comma and one of the fanboys, one of those coordinating conjunctions. So here we have the same situation. We've got our two independent clauses, but we've used the magic of English <laughs> to, uh, to connect them appropriately and correctly. So now we have the Leaning Tower of Pisa as a national landmark, and its estimated weight is 14,500 metric tons. We've also looked at another way to do this. We can just separate those two independent clauses, those two complete sentences with a period. So here we have our two independent clauses, and we've separated them appropriately using a period. You could also use a semicolon there if you're a fan of semicolons. Another example, oh, there, look, I did it there. Leaning Tower of Pisa National Landmark, it's made away as 40,500 tons, and we got a semicolon. It's getting ahead of myself. And there's another way to do it. We can just rephrase our independent clauses and make one of them dependent. And so here we've made a dependent clause out of that second uh, complete sentence. So now we have Leaning Tower of Pisa is a national landmark. That's the same sentence we had before, but we've made that second independent clause into a dependent clause and separated that off with a comma. So we've got the Leaning Tower of Pisa, which weighs about 14,500 metric tons, is a national landmark. We still have that original complete sentence. We've taken that second complete sentence and made it an incomplete sentence and plugged it into our sentence in a, in, in a, in a nice and fun way. So there's a lot of different ways to fix a run-on, like that first example there, um, and these are just a few of them. So why else do we use commas? One of the other most common reasons to use a comma is that it's used to separate items in a series. So here's an example of that. <clears throat> Professor Van de Waal loved item number one, commas, item number two, semicolons, and item number three, dashes. So that's a series of items that Professor Van de Waal loves. Professor Van de Waal loves commas, semicolons, and dashes. You'll get a little bit of grief, probably, if you are uh, you know, old school like me and you really enjoy that uh, Oxford comma, or the, sometimes it's called the serial comma. It's got a lot of names. Um, and it's the comma before that last item. And I think it's important for consistency's sake. So if you're just using the Oxford comma, when you absolutely need it, you might have some inconsistency in your document if you don't use it in some places, but you do use it in others. And I also think it's important for clarity because there are some situations where that not having that last comma can be confusing to readers. And I'll probably show you an example of that before we're done here as well. Another example, my dog's name is Pip. 
He's a tiny little chihuahua. Um, Pip chases after bugs, leaves, and squirrels. So here we have our three items separated with commas. Bugs, leaves, and squirrels. Uh, so there we got our commas to separate those items in a series. Most people are pretty good with this one, but good to get a fresh reminder. All right, another reason that we use the comma is for introductory word groups. Usually those are prepositional phrases. So let's look at an example of that. In the morning, Pip runs. Uh, a good way to know if you need to use a comma is to ask yourself where the subject of the sentence is. So in this example, our subject is Pip. And what is she doing? She runs. So there's our verb, Pip runs. Knowing that our subject is Pip, it's not the first thing in the sentence, so that usually indicates that the things that come before it probably need a comma to set them off. So in this case, it's a prepositional phrase in the morning. And so we would want to separate that with a comma because our real sentence starts when Pip runs. Another example, after class, Professor Vandewa drives home. So again, we've got our subject, Professor Vandewa, and we've got our verb, drives. Okay, so we got our subject and our verb, and the subject is not the first thing in the sentence, so we probably need a comma before it. After class, comma, Professor Vandewa drives home. Um, another prepositional phrase there, introducing the sentence. Another example, uh, this one's a little longer and more complicated, but that same rule rings true. Although Pip runs in the morning, Professor Vandewa does not see her until he drives home from class in the evenings, they are still best friends. And so the actual sentence is actually at the very end here. They are still best friends. That's the actual sentence. And the subject is they, and the verb is are, they're aring. <laughs> um, and so um, because all of that material that comes before it is just a big, long prepositional phrase, uh, we put a comma, it all introduces the actual sentence. It's an introductory word group, we put the comma right there where it needs to go. All right. Another reason that we use the comma is um, between adjectives describing the same thing. Those are called coordinate adjectives. And we'll look at a couple of quick examples here of that. We have the old red barn burned down. And so we have two adjectives. We have old and we have red. And both of those adjectives describe the barn. So we have the old barn and the red barn, the old and red barn burned down. And so since those two adjectives, we're gonna kind of shrink all that down and we can just say the old comma red barn burned down. Here's another example. The spotted ferocious chihuahua barks at intruders. Um, talking about Pip again there, uh, which is short for pipsqueak. Um, and so again, we have two adjectives that describe Chihuahua. So we have spotted and we have ferocious. Those both tell us about the Chihuahua, the ferocious Chihuahua, the spotted Chihuahua. Um, and so we just combine those together. The spotted comma ferocious Chihuahua barks at intruders. All right, we also use the comma in cases where we set off non-essential elements uh, or non-essential clauses in a sentence. And so that's kind of hard to define sometimes. Um, we like to say any phrase that can be removed without significantly changing the meaning of the sentence should be set off with commas. Um, so that gives us some gray area where um, we might be able to, or might have to make some choices, some executive decisions in our writing. Um, so I wanted to show some examples and we'll take a look at those. Might give you a little better idea of what I'm talking about here. So we've got our full sentence. The actual sentence is Pip was found in Manistee National Forest. So that's our actual sentence. Pip was found. There's our two really important parts, the subject and the verb. Um, the who is seven years old part is non-essential. We don't actually need that in the sentence. It's just extra information. So we set that off with commas. All right, it gives us a little extra information, but it doesn't tell us, it doesn't really add a lot to the sentence, doesn't change the meaning of the sentence if we don't know that information. So we would set that off with commas. 
All right, got another example here. Professor Vandewa, an avid fan of Metal Gear Solid, enjoys playing video games on his PS4. So again, we have the complete sentence there. Professor Vandewa enjoys playing video games. The extra information that isn't required, it doesn't really change the way that that sentence reads or the meaning of the sentence, is that I'm an avid fan of Metal Gear Solid. It's one of my favorite video game franchises. And so that section there, we set off with commas because it's not essential to the meaning of the sentence. All right. All right, similar to that previous one, the comma is also used to set off transitional expressions. Sometimes those come at the beginning of a sentence and other times they come in the middle. And so sometimes they even come at the very end. And so let's look at some examples just to kind of see what that looks like. Piggybacking off that last slide, the latest Metal Gear Solid game, however, was not as good as Professor V had hoped. Um, so here again, we have the transitional phrase, however, we would set that off with commas. You know, um, that just a transitional word that connects that sentence to the previous one, but it doesn't change the meaning of the sentence if you don't have it. The last Metal Gear Solid game was not as good as Professor B had hoped, but um, taking that in the context of the previous sentence, then that little transition helps us understand how those two things are related. Like, I really enjoy the franchise, but, or I really enjoy the franchise, however, the last game was not as good as I had hoped it would be. And so that transitional expression is set off with commas. Instead, Professor V revived his PS3 and plays Metal Gear online with his friends on a fan-created server. So again, we have a transitional expression there, the word instead. Um, and again, that just helps connect the ideas and tell us how these things are related. So instead of playing that new game that came out that wasn't quite as good, instead, Professor Vandewa, you know, booted up his old PS3, got working condition again, and plays the old game instead. Um, so hopefully that helps kind of illustrate what we're talking about with transitional expressions. All right, I've got a few more examples you can take a look at here, um, try and kind of insert where they need to go. Uh, we'll kind of troubleshoot them. Uh, you might want to do is pause now, maybe work through these, and then I'll talk about them. So the first one here is, it was one of the worst days of my life, and I couldn't wait for it to be over. We have a little bit of a problem there because it's a run-on right now. Uh, what we need to do, it's got two independent clauses, and there's nothing really separating them except just that coordinate conjunction. So what we need to do is include a comma. So we put the comma before that fanboy the word and, and that fixes our problem. So it was one of the worst days of my life and I couldn't wait for it to be over. Next one here, after setting up camp, I was very lonely. Um, you know, you might, some people might argue that that's okay, but we just talked about using a comma after introductory word groups. So the clear choice here is to put a comma after camp. So we have, after setting up camp, I was very lonely. All right, the next one here, the woods sounded like a huge scary monster was about to crash through them. If we're thinking back on what we've talked about, we remember that adjectives that describe the same thing can be separated with a comma. So we got the huge monster and the scary monster, and we can separate those two with a comma. We would say, the woods sounded like a huge scary monster was about to crash through them. All right, the next one here, the National Forest, established by laws and passed in 1891, was much more beautiful than I had imagined, but it was also quite unnerving. It's a little bit of a mouthful when you try and read it all at once. But um, if we set off that non-essential part of the sentence with commas, that becomes much more readable. And if we also set off that second independent clause, um, then it also becomes much more readable and avoids our run-on problem. So this is how it should look by the time you're done. The National Forest, established by laws passed in 1891, was much more beautiful than I'd imagined, but it was also quite unnerving. So we have our complete sentence. The National Forest was much more beautiful than I had imagined. So we have that complete sentence. We have another complete sentence. It was also quite unnerving. So the comma here is used to separate those two complete sentences with the fanboy but, right? So those two things, comma, and a fanboy separate the two independent clauses. And 
this whole bit here, the established by laws passed in 1891, is just extra information that we don't need. Um, it's interesting, but it's not essential to the meaning of the sentence. And so we would set that off with commas in that first independent clause. All right, last example here. Many people think I have terrible luck. For example, a group of hikers almost ran over my tent in the middle of the night. A couple different ways to revise this, but the easiest way probably is to think of the word for example as one of those transitional phrases between independent clauses. So here's how we would probably revise that. We would say, many people think I have terrible luck. We've used a semicolon to separate the independent clauses. The independent clauses are, many people think I have terrible luck, and a group of hikers almost ran over my tent. And the transitional phrase, for example, needs a comma after it to separate it and set it off. And so this is probably the best way to revise that one and makes it a little easier to read as well. Many people think I have terrible luck. For example, a group of hikers almost ran over my tent in the middle of the night. And here's a funny little illustration of why the Oxford comma is a really important thing. Um, you may have seen this online before, but with the Oxford comma, we invite three different sets of people, right? We invite the strippers, we invite JFK, and we invite Stalin. Those are our three items in the series. Without the Oxford comma, we create an appositive where it tells us more about what the things are modifying. Um, it makes you absolutely positive about what something is. That's what an, a positive does. And so in this case, we invited the strippers. Who were the strippers? JFK and Stalin. So that in that case, you could be read that JFK and Stalin are telling us more about who the strippers are, not that they're three totally separate groups of people, or three separate items in that series, which is, again, another great reason to use the Oxford comma. Before we move on, uh, one thing is to not be afraid to try something new. Uh, being able to use commas can really improve your writing in a lot of different ways. Uh, it can help you express complex thoughts um, in a clear and concise manner. And so um, get familiar with them, get to know them, get to know how they work, and always know how you're using them and why. Um, there's a ton of information about how to use commas in the textbook that I mentioned, also online. Um, if you're one of the students in my class, you can check out Blackboard. I have a bunch of resources there for how to use punctuation and commas and grammar and all that. Um, but don't be afraid to try something new. Dig in, find some good information, know why you're using it, and give it a try. And you'll always get some feedback from me um, on your papers and stuff. Like I mentioned before, knowing how to use commas correctly can drastically improve your writing style. Again, it allows you to express these complex thoughts, complex ideas in a straightforward way so that readers can understand them clearly. Without commas, as you probably noticed in some of those examples, they're a little hard to read, they're a little hard to understand until you can kind of parse them through and figure them out uh, with the right punctuation. And so commas really help you allow those uh, or allow you to express those really complex thoughts, um, but to do so in a clear way that doesn't that doesn't create confusion or problems for readers when they're working through your, your essays. Lastly, don't be afraid to ask for some help. Uh, maybe you've got a friend who's really good at editing and they can help you work through your commas. You can always talk to me before or after class or you know, leave a comment here and I can help. Um, but it doesn't hurt to ask for help. It's always good and you might learn something along the way. All right, that's all I've got about commas. I um, hope that was really helpful. hope those examples help clarify things as well. And I will hopefully see you in some more videos later on. Thank you for watching.